Hello and welcome to this online masterclass on creative wildlife photography. I'm Chaitanya Deshpande and I'd like to thank WEX in partnership with Canon for making this session possible. Before we get into what creative wildlife photography means to me, um, let me talk to you a bit about how I got into photography uh, and how I got here. Um, so started photography uh, like so many in the 80s and 90s with my parents' um, film camera, a very basic one. I think it was a Konica Minolta. Um, and at that time, the only exposure to wildlife I had uh, was in zoos. Um, so, you know, a lot of fun. Um, I recall exhausting two or three reels uh, of, of film, just uh, taking pictures of an elephant in the zoo. But, you know, that's what got me excited uh, in my early teenage years. And then, uh, didn't really do too much with it as the years went on. Uh, it was not uh, until about 10 or 12 years ago that I really picked up uh, a Canon DSLR um, camera and then really never looked back. Over the years, I've been experimenting with different types of photography, uh, but my first love, I must say, is wildlife photography. Um, I like the interaction with your natural surroundings. I like the interaction with the wildlife itself. I like, look at that. <laughs> I like the unpredictability of it. And like the fact that uh, you will never get the same image again with wildlife photography. Uh, and that makes almost every image unique. Something to remember with wildlife photography is, is the ethics of it um, and, and why you're doing it. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, you've heard or you've read a lot of stories about, um, you know, mistreatment to animals to get that perfect shot or getting too close to your subject, uh, which can put yourself and, you know, others in danger. Um, you've read stories about captured animals being photographed to make them look like they're in the wild. All of these things are a big no-no. So, so before, um, you know, you venture out to take any wildlife photographs keep these in mind i'm sure all of you do it um, already uh, but it's just something uh, some people tend to forget in their excitement to get that uh, once in a lifetime shot uh, they compromise um, the, the 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 ethics the, the morals and and um, you know put the wildlife at risk and put themselves at risk so that's uh, an important thing to, to remember. It's, it's a great time to be a wildlife photographer um, only because camera equipment these days has come such a long way even in the last 10 years and definitely in the last 20, 30 years or more. Cameras have become lighter, lenses have become lighter, um, tracking systems, you know, eye tracking, wildlife eye tracking, uh, autofocus systems, the number of focus points you have on your camera, shutter speeds, um, you name it, everything in wildlife photography has just um, become so much better um, and you as the photographer are able to take images that even 10 or 15 years ago would have been uh, impossible to take. But that doesn't take away from the fact that you as the photographer um, are the one taking the image. Um, you often hear about this uh, joke that's uh, goes around in, in photography circles uh, when people ask um, oh that's a great image you know what camera do you use um, a lot of people say that's like asking oh that's a great house you know um, what uh, building tools have you used um, well it's, it's not an exact analogy but you know it drives home the point that the creativity uh, the eye um, you know the the kind of personality of the photographer uh, plays an important part uh, in the image that is created finally uh, and from this session's point of view we talk about creativity it's really um, a lot about the individual um, and of course about the animal um, but only when you understand the animal so that's again you can you create a, a, a photograph that's um, creative from from a behavior point of view which brings me to to my next point um, there's various way you, ways you can be creative with wildlife photography. Um, but for me, there are two main elements. One is you and what you do uh, in terms of the light, in terms of how you frame the image. Uh, and two, the wildlife, the animal or the bird itself. 
um, and what the animal does that is interesting, that is unique, uh, that can make the photograph creative. So, so it's about these two elements and, and you may not always get both, uh, but through, through this session, um, I'll try and show you how, um, you know, understanding animal behavior uh, can also lead to, to really creative images. In today's session, um, we're going to uh, talk about the technical aspects, so, so some of the camera setup, uh, gear, etc. that's used, um, the way you can scout for and, and find wildlife, uh, and I'll talk about the importance of being local. So you can see I'm, I'm, <coughs> I'm at a um, pond not far from where I am. Um, there's a there's good amount of bird life here, and I come here often for my photos. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, we're going to talk about how to use um, the light creatively um, and, and what constitutes for me uh, a creative in image. There's various type of, uh, <clears throat> types of creative images, uh, but I'll um, talk about how I think of, of a creative image. And ultimately, I'll take you through some of my images uh, and talk you through you know, what I did uh, to make that image possible. We'll be on the field, so we're not going to be all here. Um, I'm going to hopefully be able to show you, um, you know, how, how I work in the field. Um, and so you see less of me, more of the wildlife. So, uh, you know, after this introduction, um, and I hope uh, at the end of it, uh, you come away with some tips, uh, some tricks and some inspiration uh, to shoot uh, creative wildlife images. One of the questions I get very often is, um, you know, how did you shoot this image? Um, and it doesn't stop at that, you know, what's the camera you used? What is the lens you used? And then ultimately, of course, what were your camera settings? So just, just to de demystify uh, this a little bit, um, yes, the camera matters. Yes, the lens matters. And yes, the setting matters, but for that particular image. So, um, you know, you can't have your camera set uh, at a certain shutter speed or an ISO or aperture forever and expect to get creative images um, every time you, you shoot with those settings. Uh, similarly, uh, just because you have uh, the latest um, camera body or the, or the longest uh, lens, uh, it really doesn't mean that you're going to get the best image. So um, what I often say is uh, whether you're starting out or whether you're uh, you know, a few years into your photography, the best camera and the best lens is the one you can afford. And trust me, there's, there's tons of things, there's uh, loads of animals even you can shoot uh, with relatively um, basic equipment. Cameras these days are very powerful. Um, today's, um, you know, basic sensor in a, in a in a in a startup kit would probably be more advanced than the most advanced sensor 15 or 20 years ago so uh, and and you can see wildlife images from 15 or 20 years ago and they're absolutely amazing so so there's absolutely no excuse in 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 that respect um between the cameras and, and lenses i tend to to um, prefer spending more on my lenses um, i found that a good lens can can really elevate your image but you know uh, it's your choice you may want to go for a higher shutter speed uh, you may want to go for a full frame versus a cropped sensor things like that uh, but having a good lens um, really helps talking about lenses um, Wex and Canon have been very kind to to um, give me this beautiful 600 mm lens to try out for this session so so we will be taking photos with this you can see compared to a 70 200 mm lens uh, you know the, the difference in size and what you can do with this lens uh, and what you can not do with this lens and and vice versa so so um, you know um, I'm really excited to try this out it's it's the um, 600 mm mark 3 uh, released two or three years ago so much lighter than before um, and that brings me to this point about you know tripods and and tripod heads um, I like to do my photography uh, handheld just gives me that creativity, that mobility, uh, that freedom to be able to change when I need to and adjust as quickly as I need to. Um, so with this 600mm, even though it's, it's a beast of a lens you can see, uh, it's, it's light enough for me to handhold. Uh, I've done uh, the other day, uh, you know, four hours out with this lens, um, continuously handholding it. 
uh, yes and after that it can get tiring but you know it, it really uh, is something you can go out with um, and and uh, not need a big tripod or a, or a gimbal tripod head for example to to um, take your photos gear and technical advice before we uh, get into some of the shooting elements uh, uh, themselves um, I won't make this session too technical uh, because you can spend 10 sessions just talking about um, you know focusing just on camera settings and and, and technical aspects of uh, photography of any kind but also of wildlife photography just a few um, important things that will help you with your uh, wildlife photography and ultimately help you with uh, making it more creative uh, is your shutter speed so you know um, uh, remember a time when four or five frames per second was quick uh, you now have in I think in the latest uh, uh, mirrorless cam cameras the the R3 from Canon that's going to come out 20 frames per second so you know uh, you can absolutely knock yourself out there um, as I've talked about lens um, um, I, I shoot with my 70 200 my 300 mm and um, of course uh, the 600 mm that I, that I now have so for this for this session you know we'll use that but um, really I think <coughs> <clears throat> especially if you're shooting um, local uh, which I prefer to do and I'll, I'll talk about why uh, you can even work with the 7200 mm because you you know the lay of the land um, and it really depends on what you're shooting um, but because I like to have more of my image captured uh, the environment the setting um, especially when I have light filtering through through trees uh, on a misty morning uh, if you only focus on the subject you're going to miss out that beautiful um, gorgeous environment that the that the animal in, is in so um, so you can even really you know um, spend time with your 7200 and and come back with really uh, interesting images uh, the other thing with lenses is I try to stick to one lens for a particular session today of course is different because we're, we're talking about a few things but um, focusing uh, your session you know to, to one lens really simplifies uh, your workflow so whether it's my 300 mm or my 7200 that's it um, i stick to that lens um, um, and yes you could feel like you're missing out on um, <clears throat> on on uh, certain shots because either they're further away and you need a longer um, you know a bigger telephoto lens uh, but you know that applies to anything you're missing out some shots because you're in another location for example so try and use one lens uh, if you can um, so you know you will then maximize what you can do with that lens uh, you'll simplify things you will not just dis get distracted by um, you know trying to change your lens on another body or even if you have two camera bodies trying to carry them both um, yes those can be advantages if you've traveled thousands of miles away to a trip of a lifetime and you don't want to miss that great shot but that's where you know shooting local is such an advantage you can always come back the next day you can come back the next year seasons you know will repeat fortunately uh, you know sorry unless uh, global warming has something to say about it but you know you're likely to get those kind of conditions um, and and uh, so you know that's that's another advantage of of uh, keeping it simple um, and shooting local as I've said there's there's no um, single camera setting that will always deliver good images so so experiment uh, with your camera um, play around see what works best in a certain light situation break the rules as, as they often say but uh, a few things that that will help and again I'm not going to go into detail on this because uh, it, it could take a long time um, but typically especially in the UK where yes you do get sunny days but um, you know the you are sometimes struggling for light uh, early in the mornings late in the evenings when there's a bit of mist um, I'd use the the camera's widest aperture so the you know this one is a f4 uh, so that bring, lets in the most amount of light uh, yes it does compromise <coughs> in some other areas so so in terms of your um, uh, the way your ISO setting needs to be uh, what your shutter speed needs to be but um, I typically and and this is a, a, a general kind of guideline uh, would use my widest setting and in terms of your camera itself uh, now just just a few key elements um, um, your shutter speed you know adjust it 
depending on on what your um, aperture uh, uh, affords you uh, your ISO again make sure that the, the image is 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 well lit um, your uh, metering um, I'd, I'd suggest uh, uh, spot metering uh, focusing on that subject on the wildlife and you know you probably know this you know the the eye of, of the subject as, as usual unless there are various elements in the subject then then you can choose where you want to focus on to make the image um, as, as creative as you want um, um, and um, in terms of white balance again uh, depending on the conditions um, I try and stick to one white balance so so keep it on, on sunny for example so that I know that all my images have been shot at that one white balance and then when I need to adjust um, I, I can adjust it okay in terms of um, focusing you have most cameras now with 61 or, or at least a few tens of, of focusing points um, I'd use the ones typically in, in the middle of your uh, focusing area they are the most sensitive uh, the cross focus points are the most sensitive to, to light and you're likely to to hit your uh, focus better when you use those uh, in terms of the the camera's manual or autofocus um, uh, whether you focus manually or um, using autofocus, when you hit the focus, the, 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 the image is as sharp or as blurry. So there's no difference with that. With wildlife, because things change so quickly, um, autofocus is the way to go. Uh, if you need to, make your autofocus silent. So when you, you know, when your camera hits the focus, it doesn't make that beeping sound. Um, I'm, I'm local with my wildlife, so I don't really, really need that. But uh, in, in some conditions with uh, animals that scare easily, uh, you will probably you will probably need that so um, why these settings you may ask uh, well uh, for me an important uh, element is to be able to isolate the subject uh, so you can do that in in two ways uh, either the subject is very close to you and everything else behind gets isolated because you are on a uh, you're wide open as they say so so you're an f4 as an aperture or f2.8 uh, that depth of field uh, is 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 um, very low um, but um, you get a nice blurry background uh, and the longer the telephoto uh, or, the, or the longer your um, kind of mm so the, the reach is uh, the better typically uh, the blurriness of the out of focus areas in your subject again you can have a whole sessions on, on that uh, but generally it's more aesthetically pleasing uh, to have uh, subject isolation, is sorry, isolation, and the uh, quality of the blurriness uh, is almost sometimes as important as the um, focus uh, or the subject that is in focus. So f4 or being wide open gives you that. Um, all the other settings, again, you will change uh, as you need to, and that brings me to you know what you need to use on this little wheel here in terms of your uh, cameras. Um, setting is it on auto uh, i wouldn't think you know i would go on auto because you know that really uh, limits my creativity would you go on shutter priority um so you know let the camera uh, kind of decide what uh, what the aperture needs to be would you go on aperture priority so set your aperture f4 certainly you know what i've talked about um you know using aperture priority is absolutely um you know very very helpful but what can happen by using aperture priority is um, the way your camera um, sees a certain subject may not be uh, the most creative. So keep uh, uh, that in mind. Uh, experiment with aperture priority, experiment with shutter priority. And ultimately for me, uh, I always use manual. So again, going back to that point about knowing your camera, knowing your lens, and also knowing your local area. So you know, you know, what type of the amount of light throughout the day which time of the day and and you can change your settings whether it's shutter speed iso uh, aperture on your own on on manual user mode but you know use whatever you feel comfortable with you will notice today that um, i'll i'll um, focus on two subjects for for, for this session swans uh, and deer uh, you, you could focus on on geese on 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 other birds insects egrets whatever you like but uh, a point to make there is um, again the more focused you are with a particular species of bird or animal uh, the more you're likely to learn about it 
um, and the better your images are likely to be of that particular subject. You see a lot of wildlife photographers focusing on, uh, let's say, animals in the snow. So the element is, is consistent all through uh, on this particular species, really following those, um, those uh, animals throughout uh, the seasons in a particular area. Um, and so specializing like that, um, one, of course, makes you an expert uh, about that uh, particular species in that particular environment um, and because you know the behavior so well you come away with images images that are much more rewarding um, much more creative uh, and really tell a story Swans are some of the most common subjects for photography, uh, bird photography in uh, the UK and uh, wherever they are present around the world. Um, a number of species of swans exist. Um, in the UK it's more the mute swan. It's the heaviest, uh, probably the largest flying bird in, in the UK. So it makes for a great subject because you can photograph them all year round, across the seasons across their life cycle and in almost every corner of the country. But because they're such a common subject um, and photographed every day, it can be difficult for your swan images to stand out. So here are a few tips uh, to help you do that, to think about your swan images more creatively. First of all, try and change your point of reference get down to the level of the water uh, at eye level with the swans and see how that changes uh, the image. You'll see that the reflections change. You'll see that the image themselves uh, or the image itself becomes more intimate. You get a more personal point of view with the swan. Next, find the best light in which you can photograph swans. So by this, I mean Look at this morning, it's it's good, but there could have been more mist, the sunrise could have been more spectacular. The more spectacular the conditions are, uh, the more likely you will come away with an image that has additional elements in addition to the main subject, which is the swan, that uh, make the image stand out. Um, next, look at swans not, not just as a, a subject for a single image, but um, tell a story with your images. So photograph them through the seasons, throughout the year, create a set of images instead of just that one image that stands out. To the viewer, that becomes much more of a story rather than just a single image. And finally, really think creatively when taking swan images or composing your, your photo. So it would be the way you, you know, focus on one part of their body, their incredibly graceful necks, uh, their feathers, um, play with shadows um, when they're flying. If you can look at a creative angle um, head on or from the back, uh, there's various things you can do uh, with uh, composition. So that's another way to, to make your images more creative when it comes to swan photography. Your camera setup with swan photography isn't um, largely different from any other wildlife photography as such. You, know, you may want to keep uh, the subject in focus and uh, work with a very shallow depth of field so that the swan stands out from its background. Knowing your location, so the pond or lake where you photograph your swans, like the back of your hand, will help you immensely in being able to plan and anticipate a shot that others who visit it once or twice a year may not even think is possible. Take this image as an example. 
it was shot from the exact spot I'm, I'm standing at in the video. Planning for this involved knowing um, where the sun would rise, making sure I'm here on a misty day, and of course the swan playing its part as well. Um, it took me a month or so to be able to get the swan in the right position because that's out of my control, but everything else is down to planning. Here's a live example of what I mean when I say I should get down to eye level with the swan or very low on the water. Um, you can see as it looks now, yes, it's, it's an interesting scene. There's some mist in the background, but really taking an image from here standing up uh, would only yield quite a normal swan image. Um, and then if I now experiment and, and go to the level of the water, eye level with the swan. It produces completely different feel to the image. You can capture the mist in the background as part of the image. And of course, the quality of the reflection also becomes more pleasing. A few other examples of this uh, with images I've taken in the past. Uh, and you can combine multiple elements of creativity with this. You can see this one's a low-key image, also at eye level with the swans. I find photographing swans very rewarding. Um, there are hundreds and thousands of different ways you can photograph these amazing birds that have quite a history with the country as well. Cygnets are an absolute favorite, especially when they're only a few weeks old and still riding on their mom's backs. Each of them has a great character and uh, if you can catch those little details, um, catch them in different weather conditions, understand their behavior enough to know when they will produce a show. Um, you can often find them flapping their wings just above the surface of the water, um, as you see in this set of images. And I've also observed some very family-specific or pond-specific behavior. Take this set of images. Uh, this is the only swan family I know locally that uh, feeds its young um, cygnets like this. Everything I've talked about from a creative process point of view, of course, doesn't stop at swans. You can use the same principles with other birds. As long as you're willing to be patient, spend time in the field, understanding wildlife, you will start coming away with images that represent your unique style and your own creativity. Deer are my favorite wildlife photography subject. Um, living in the south of England, um, and actually anywhere across uh, the UK, you can come across various species of deer. Um, you have red deer, fallow deer, roe, native to, to, to the country, a manjak, sika, Chinese water deer, and each of them have their own uh, special characteristics that you can capture across the various seasons of the year. Approaching these different species of deer, again, each of them require um, different styles. Uh, you will notice that roe deer, for example, are very shy. Red deer and fallow deer in, in some of the um, deer parks uh, across uh, the country are not that shy and so easier to photograph. So um, see you know, how you can get familiarized with your subject. You know what works best, but if you're looking at wild deer, then you really need to uh, approach very carefully. Make sure you don't disturb the wildlife and make sure that you capture their most natural behavior on camera. 
the most important step for me in terms of planning my shoots is um, knowing the weather on the morning or the day that I'm going to be outside shooting wildlife. Um, there's various apps you can use. Uh, what you can see on screen is an app called Clear Outside. You can check the wind, um, the fog, the humidity. Uh, make sure you know what you're going for. I mean, the type of image that you want to make and um, having a good understanding of the weather is absolutely key. There's various other apps you can use uh, for your photography. I'm just going to show you one more uh, on the right of your screen. This is a depth of field app. So if you have a telephoto lens and you're shooting, let's say, in a herd of deer, you don't want to miss your focus because um, with telephoto lens, the depth of field can be pretty shallow. Uh, as you can see here on a 300 mm at a distance of 60 meters, the depth of field is about five meters. So you want to make sure you're focused in the right place uh, to use these apps at your disposal. You can see here that the subject, so the deer uh, are well lit. This is because the sun is behind me, um, but always try and experiment and change your position. Um, you know, what the same herd would look like if you were facing the sun. So for example, look at that. It's the same morning, just five minutes later, I've gone to the other side of the tree and you can see what a big difference it makes. Shooting against the sun takes some practice <clears throat> and, and it can be frustrating because the camera could struggle to focus. Uh, there could be too much light uh, in your viewfinder. But if you can get the right image, um, it's very rewarding. One element of wildlife photography that I think is um, often overlooked is being flexible. Yes, you come with equipment and, and planning and for a particular subject, but I noticed five minutes ago that there were some geese, uh, a large number of geese in the field behind this, these deer that we just saw. So um, I thought, why not look at something different with these geese? And you know, they were all bunched up. So um, could I juxtapose these geese with deer in the background, for example. Uh, so that meant that I had to walk around them, uh, change my course a little bit, but that added hard work can give you some interesting images. So I've come around the geese now. You can see the, the deer, uh, the hinds are in the background. Um, and let's see if I can get an interesting shot with these geese in the foreground and the deer in the background. Um, something like this and you can experiment with your composition um, you can have a portrait image you can have a landscape image let's explore another setting with these deer. Um, woodland wildlife photography is quite challenging. Uh, there's a number of obstacles um, you face uh, in terms of the trees, in terms of the way the light comes through. But if you have the right light and a bit of mist, for example, as you can see here, it can give you some very mystical shots, uh, almost a fairy tale like quality, uh, which is why I try and spend quite a bit of time in some of the uh, wooded areas where I know based on every season um, in which direction the light will filter through uh, in spring, in summer, in autumn. These are the months where you get uh, some good amount of mist in, in the woods across the UK, at least in, in the south of the country. And please um, always keep in mind again to keep that distance from the wildlife, um, giving them their space. What I like about shooting in wooded areas is uh, the hundreds of different types of compositions you can get. Um, if you look at this um, scene, for example, on the right, 
you can see the hind with her fawns um, playing around. So that can be one image uh, right in front of me. There were other deer walking around. That could be another image. Uh, but you can try and find uh, the composition that works for you, that looks the most um, creative. Um, and you can see the, the fonts uh, on the right there. You saw the couple of images that I just shared with you. The light seems to be filtering through better on the right hand side of the image, thanks to the background. Uh, the trees complement the scene very well. Um, so if I was shooting in this wood, that's where I would focus on. Here we've uh, close up of that same scene. Uh, I've zoomed in a little, I haven't moved, so kept that distance. Uh, and you can see how the background really helps bring out the image. We've talked about the importance of understanding wildlife and animal behavior and how it can elevate your photography. And here's an example. In the spring and summer months, you will find red deer reaching out for those tender leaves um, on, on the branches above them. Um, and because in the early mornings, because of the dew, those branches um, are full of dew, you can get some pretty interesting shots as they reach up and, and pull down branches with um, the water from those leaves creating a shower effect. In these situations as well, if you can position yourself so that you're facing into the light, you can get some quite dramatic silhouette shots as you can see here. Uh, this was a stag on another day, not the hind that we just saw, but a uh, similar situation I was able to get um, the silhouette perfectly against the sun with the um, dew falling all around the stag. So we're out here early on a summer morning. Um, the sun rises to, to my left can see a herd of deer in the distance. Um, some nice bit of mist in the background. I'm going to try to use that for my image. Um, early mornings is, is when uh, animals generally are uh, at their most active, early mornings and evenings. Um, so we're here at the right time. Um, at this time of the year, the stags are, at least in, in the red deer species, the stags are um, together. Uh, just before the rutting season in the, in the autumn uh, when they all turn against each other but at this time of the year is, is great for getting uh, groups of big males, big stags um, walking around together. So let's see how we can use this uh, this group of stags to our advantage. Um, with the sun uh, to my left, uh, I think that mist that you see in the background is going to get lit up. Um, so that could give us uh, a few opportunities, uh, a few different options. I'll try and move around and sorry for the camera shake here, but with wildlife photography, I guess when you're on the field, uh, it's never going to be all uh, in the same spot. You have to move around a bit, uh, especially with the type of photography I do. I try and uh, find different angles. If one doesn't work, well, you know, quickly move around. Um, I shoot quite local, so for me, I, I know the lay of the land well, uh, and that helps in being able to find, over time, over repeated visits, the best uh, angles, the best spots, some favorite trees even, So I'm just seeing the best way we can use uh, the mist at the back. 
Look at that, there's mommies there so the so the herd could walk to their left. Um, because the sun is rising from there, I'm trying to get uh, behind the stags as it were to, to get them against the light. Um, so as usual, keep your distance from wildlife uh, with these stags, you know, um, can be quite unpredictable. Um, 50 to 100 meters is advised even more sometimes uh, so that's what I'm going to do I've zoomed in fully here so I'm not really close to them okay I've been able to come around slightly you can see the mist is a bit thicker in the background I've lost some of the um, distraction in the background as well. I have these uh, dark trees uh, and the mist, and hopefully that will isolate my subject. As you can see there, that young stag, uh, and then there's a couple of stags to the left as well. So that's the scene um, I'm working with. Uh, here we go. There'll definitely be more light now as the sun rises. Sadly, no sunrise that morning, so I've moved to another herd of deer. Uh, good time to test that depth of field app. You can see the deer are quite tightly bunched together, so you want to focus on a particular deer and not uh, miss your focus, so you get a good sense of what the depth of field is with that app. Also try and find different compositions. At this time of the year, I know uh, deer um, have their velvet on their antlers, so see how the sunlight can catch that. Um, edit the image differently, as you saw there. Um, and you'll see another example of um, an edited image where uh, I've highlighted the rim around the antler fur. Um, again, a great way to, to look at uh, your deer images a little more creatively. So before I summarize, and because we can't get all these weather conditions and, and shooting conditions um, to show you on the field, I thought I'll take you through a few of my images um, with the settings displayed and um, talk you through how I got the image. This one clearly on a misty summer morning, um, got against the sun, made sure I captured those the rays of light uh, in that beautiful mist. This next image is, is all about the composition. I uh, used a longish lens, 300 mm, as you can see, to get these five deer in a geometric pattern. This next image is uh, one of my favorites uh, in, in the woods. Um, you can't really get this type of image with a long telephoto lens, so you have to let the image breathe a bit, as you can see with this one, 7200 mm, to really catch uh, the sense of scale in, in, the, in the scene. I took two years to plan this next image. Uh, luckily, I have a video of it as well. Um, but uh, great conditions one morning. But yeah, this was more about the planning that went behind to be able to capture this moment at this particular spot. I love shooting in and around water, uh, birds, animals. It really gives um, your image an added dimension, especially with reflections. Uh, in this case, of course, at sunrise and then the swan reflected in the foreground. Um, birds taking off on water, um, geese, any types of water bird, um, if you follow them enough and understand their um, routine, you can get <clears throat> very interesting images of birds in flight. It does take some patience with birds uh, at times because everything happens so quickly. Uh, this image, for example, probably exhausted about 200 shots before I got an image that I liked. Um, it's a lot of trial and error, but again, you can come away with something quite rewarding. Talking about birds, you can take that one step further, not just the birds, but also other animals that they can be shot juxtaposed with. Um, this is all about understanding 
um, behavior, in this case starlings and, and what they do on summer mornings uh, around deer. Your images don't really have to feature rare birds or animals to be creative. Take this Egyptian goose for example, caught in the right light um, and you, know, you can have uh, a unique image even with um, some common birds around you, even in your garden. Here's another Egyptian goose with a very good sense of place, or maybe I knew exactly where I should stand to get this image. Uh, but just another example of um, fairly common birds in a striking, creative image. In summary then, um, what are some of the key things to, that you can take away uh, to make your wildlife photography more creative? First and foremost, master the light. Play with the light, understand the light, uh, the lack of it, what it does to your image. Uh, that absolutely um, can elevate your images from um, quite subject focused, um, you know, um, kind of recording a species image to a much more um, evocative, um, inspiring and uh, an image that, that talks, tells a, a story. Follow and understand why life or a species behaves um, across the year in different seasons um, uh, and, and you know you're sure to come away with images that are um, not just personally more rewarding uh, but also uh, more creative from a photography point of view. Third, make the elements, um, the weather um, work for you, right? So, so you can have mist, you can have rain, you can have um, sunshine, um, you can have you know, darkness, uh, cloud cover. All of those can um, give you really interesting images. Uh, there's other natural elements, the trees, you've seen trees feature heavily in my, in my photos. Uh, the sun, the moon, uh, juxtaposition um, with those uh, uh, kind of uh, natural elements or heavenly bodies again, um, you know, can really, really add something else to your, to your images. So, so use that to your advantage. Experiment and stretch your camera's capabilities as I talked uh, about it right at the beginning. You know, your settings, how they work for you, what doesn't work. Um, you know, cameras these days are very versatile. You know, lenses afford you that reach that was never possible um, a decade or, or more ago. So, so um, experiment with that, stretch your camera to its, to its limit and come up with, with your own, own style of images. Try different types of um, compositions, let your image breathe. Uh, going back to that point about using different types of, uh, of lenses, um, wider lenses to, to capture not just the subject but everything around it. Um, so composition and creative composition. And finally, um, you know, there's various different types of photography you can do within wildlife photography. You can focus on reflections, you can focus on high key images, low key images, and you've seen some examples um, uh, from the images that I've just shown you. Um, you. You can focus on silhouettes, and you really can't go wrong with a good silhouette of, uh, of an interesting species or, or even uh, a very common species against uh, beautiful light. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this masterclass on uh, creative wildlife photography. My contact details have been shared by WEX. You can, you can get in touch with me via email, via my Instagram account. And I'm happy to answer any other questions you may have. Thank you.